hello guys okay as I stated in the um, previous videos today um, my phone if it went dead because my son did have it earlier um, watching the cartoons and stuff I was gonna put it on the charger so the first two videos I recorded it um, where you guys could like see me and everything but the remaining videos for today um, I'm gonna try to do this one if you guys if you guys don't get another one after this one then that'll be it for today but I'm trying to um, read as much as possible by Tuesday um, because come April we're gonna like I said you guys already know this we're gonna be on a new thing so I'm um, being diligent we're getting the book out and we are um, still on page we're on page 202 and we're on day 26 going through temptation so I'm gonna go back up and I'm going to read no we're on page 203 we're still in the same day but we're on page 203 talking about how temptation works we're on the um if you're following along with me in the book 203 we're in the bottom like the last paragraph of that page getting ready to turn over we're still in purpose number three you were created to become like christ this is the third video on this book for today so guys we're making a lot more progress um and i thank god for that so if you miss videos one through current feel free to check them out um, like I said, we're not doing any more recaps or overviews. We're just going to continue reading. So let's jump back into this, guys. We think temptation lies around us, but God says it begins within us. If you didn't have the internal desire, the temptation could not attract you. Temptation always starts in your mind, not in circumstances. Jesus said, for from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, eagerness for lustful pleasure envy slander pride and foolishness all these vile things come from within that's scripture three james tells us that there is a whole army of evil desires within you that's scripture four step two is doubt give me one second guys let me look at something okay step two is doubt satan tries to get to get you to doubt what god has said about the sin excuse me is it really wrong did God really say not to do it? Didn't God mean this prohibition for someone else or some other time? Doesn't God want me to be happy? The Bible warns, watch out. Don't let evil thoughts or doubts make any of you turn from the living God. That's scripture five. Step three is deception. Satan is incapable. We're on page 204 for you following along with me in the book of telling the truth. And it's called the father of lies. That's scripture six. Anything he tells you will be untrue or just half true. Satan offers his lie to replace what God has already said in his word. Satan says, you will not die. You'll be wiser like God. You can get away with it. No one will ever know. It will solve your problem. Besides, everyone else is doing it. It is only a little sin. But a little sin is like being <laughs> a little pregnant. It will eventually show itself. Ain't that the truth, guys? Step four is disobedience. You finally act on the thought you've been toying with in your mind. What began as an idea gives birth into behavior. You give in to whatever got your attention. You believe Satan's lies and fall into the trap that James warns about. We are tempted when we are drawn away and trapped by our own evil desires. Then our evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear friends. That's scripture 7. The next point we're talking about is overcoming temptation. We just read about how temptation works. Now we're talking about overcoming temptation. Understanding how temptation works is in itself helpful, but there are specific steps you need to take to overcome it. And the first point, guys, that he has outlined is refuse to be intimidated. Many Christians are frightened and demoralized by tempting thoughts, feeling guilty that they aren't beyond temptation. They feel ashamed just for being tempted. This is a misunderstanding of maturity. You will never outgrow temptation. In one sense, you can consider temptation a compliment. Satan does not have to tempt those who are already doing his evil will. They are already here. Somebody leave that below in the comment section. Or if you're taking notes, write that down. Temptation is a sign that Satan hates you, not a sign of weakness or worldliness. It is also a normal part of being human and living in a fallen world. Don't be surprised, excuse me guys, or shocked or discouraged by it. Be realistic about the inevitability of temptation. You will never be able to avoid it completely. The Bible says when you're tempted, not if. 
all advisors, remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience in that scripture eight. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted, yet he never sinned. That's scripture nine. Temptation also becomes a sin. I'm sorry, temptation only becomes a sin when you give into it. Martin Luther said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't keep the devil from suggesting thoughts. But you can choose not to dwell or act on them. For example, many people don't know the difference between physical attraction or sexual arousal in lust. They are not the same. God made every one of us a sexual being and that is good. Attraction and arousal are the natural, spontaneous, God-given responses to physical beauty. Sorry guys, something was on my finger. Physical beauty while lust is a deliberate act of the will. Lust is a choice to commit in your mind what you'd like to do with your body. You can be attracted or even aroused without choosing by, to sin by lusting. Many people, especially Christian men, feel guilty that their God-given hormones are working. When they automatically notice an attractive woman, they assume it is lust and feel ashamed and condemned. But attraction is not lust until you begin to dwell on it. Actually, the closer you grow to God, the more Satan will try to tempt you. The moment you became God's child, Satan, like a mobster hitman, put out a contract on you. You are his enemy and he's plotting your downfall. We're on page 206 for you following along with me in the book. Sometimes while praying, Satan will suggest a bazaar. Just got a, um, another notification. I'm ignoring that. Something about um, another notification. Sometimes while you are praying, Satan will suggest a bizarre or evil thought just to distract you and shame you. Don't be alarmed or ashamed by this, but realize that Satan fears your prayers and will try anything to stop them. Instead of condemning yourself with, how can I think such a thought? Treat it as a distraction from Satan and immediately refocus on God. So the next point is recognize your pattern of temptation and be prepared for it. There are certain situations that make you more vulnerable to temptation than others. Some circumstances will cause you to stumble almost immediately while others don't bother you so much. These situations are unique to your weaknesses and you need to identify them because Satan surely knows them. He knows exactly what trips you up and he is constantly working to get you into those circumstances. Peter warns, stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and will lighten nothing better than to catch you napping. That is 10. Ask yourself, when am I most tempted? What day of the week? What time of day? Ask, where am I most tempted? At work, at home, at a neighbor's house, at a sports bar, in an airport, or a motel out of town? Ask, who is with me when I'm most tempted? Friends, co-workers, a crowd of strangers when I'm alone? Also ask, how do I usually feel when I am most tempted? It may be when you are tired or lonely or bored or depressed or under stress. It may be when you've been hurt or angry or worried or after a big success for a spiritual high. Excuse me, guys. Okay, so you should identify your typical pattern of temptation and then prepare to avoid those situations as much as possible. The Bible tells us repeatedly to anticipate and be ready to face temptation. That's 11. Paul said, don't give the devil a chance. That's 12. Wise planning reduces temptation. Follow the advice of Proverbs. Plan carefully what you do. We're on page 207. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off the right way. That's 13. God's people avoid evil ways and they protect themselves by watching where, they're, where, where they go. That's 14. The next point, guys, is request God's help. We're still on day 26, growing through temptation. Heaven has a 24-hour emergency hotline. God wants you to ask him for assistance in overcoming temptation. He says, call on me in times of trouble. I will rescue you and you will honor me. That is um, 15. I call this a microwave prayer because it is quick and to the point. Help, SOS, Mayday. When temptation strikes, you don't have time for a long conversation with God. You simply cry out. David, Daniel, Peter, Paul, and millions of others have prayed this kind of instant prayer for help in trouble. The Bible guarantees that our cry for help will be heard because Jesus is sympathetic to our struggle. He faced the same temptations we do. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. That's scripture 16. And guys, I want to encourage you, if this series with us reading along of the Purpose Driven Life is a blessing to you, and it's enlightening, and it's encouraging to you, share it with someone that you think that it may be a blessing to as well. The videos are up and available for the replay. I 
try to create playlists for you guys and organize them so it's easier to go to. But share this, you know, with someone that you feel like it may bless or it may encourage. You never know who will be encouraged or blessed by what, you know. So I just want to say that. So let's go back up. So he understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. That's 16. If God is waiting to help us defeat temptation, why don't we turn to him more often? Honestly, sometimes we don't want to be helped. We want to give in to temptation even though we know it's wrong. At that moment, we think we know what's best for us more than God does. At other times, we're embarrassed to ask God for help because we keep giving in to the same temptation over and over. But God never gets irritated, bored, or impatient. Will we keep coming back to him? The Bible says, let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. That's scripture 17. God's love is everlasting and his patience endures forever. Excuse me, guys. If you have to cry out for God's help 200 times a day to defeat a particular temptation, he will still be eager to give mercy and grace. So come boldly. Ask him for the power to do the right thing and then expect him to provide it. So we're on page 208. Before we get into defeating temptation in day 27, let's close day 26. And then I'm not sh even sure, guys, because I was in mom mode and reading with you guys. So I'm not sure if I read the um, scriptures to you guys. I think I did. But just in case if I didn't, I will reread the scriptures to you guys again for day 26. But I believe I did already. I believe I read them, but I will just read them again just to be on the safe side. So temptations keep us dependent upon God. Just as the roots grow stronger when wind blows against a tree, so every time you stand up to a temptation, you become more like Jesus. When you stumble, which you will, it is not fatal. Instead of giving in or giving up, look up to God, expect him to help you, and remember the reward that is waiting for you. When people are tempted and still continue strong, they should be happy. After they have proved their faith, God will reward them with life forever. That's 18. Day 26, thinking about my purpose, point to ponder. Every temptation is an opportunity to do good. First, to remember God blesses the people who patiently endure testing. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That's James 1, 12 in the NLT. And then a question to consider. What Christ-like character quality can I develop by defeating the most common temptation I face? And let me briefly give you guys the scriptures um, for 26. Growing through temptation, Galatians 5, 22, 23. Next, number two, reading on 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Mark 7, 21, 23. James 4, 1. Hebrews 3, 12. John 8, 44. James 1, 14 through 16. 8 is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 9, Hebrews 4, 15. Next is 1 Peter 5, 8. 11 is Matthew 26, 41. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 and 8. 1 Peter 1, 13, 4, 7 and 5, 8. 12 is Ephesians 4, 27. 13 is Proverbs 4, 26 through 27. 14 is Proverbs 16 and 17. 15 Psalms 50, 15. 16 Hebrews 4, 15. 17 Hebrews 4, 16. 18 James 1, 12. Now we're going to move on to day 27, defeating temptation, guys. Let me know in the comment section what you guys are getting out of our reading for today. So we're on page 209, defeating temptation. Run from anything that gives you the evil thoughts, but stay close to anything that makes you want to do right. That's 2 Timothy 2.22 in the LB. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13 NLT is remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. There is always a way out. Somebody say that with me. There is always a way out. You may sometimes feel that a temptation is too overpowering for you to bear, but that's a lie from Satan. God has promised never to allow more on you than he puts within you to handle it. He will not permit any temptation that you cannot overcome. However, you must do your part, too, by practicing for a biblical peace to defeat in temptation. And let's start with key number one, guys. Refocus your attention on something else. Somebody say that with me. Refocus your attention on something else. 
It may surprise you that nowhere in the Bible are we told to resist temptation. We are told to resist the devil, but that is very different, as I'll explain later. Instead, we are advised to refocus our attention because resisting a thought doesn't work. It only intensifies our focus on the wrong thing and strengthens its alert. Let me explain. Every time you try to block a thought out of your mind, a thought out of your mind, you drive it deeper into your memory. By resisting it, you actually reinforce it. This is especially true with temptation. You don't defeat temptation by fighting the feeling of it. The more you fight a feeling, the more it consumes and controls you. This thought says the battle for sin is won or lost in your mind. Whatever gets your attention will get you. So getting back to the more you fight a feeling, the more it consumes and controls you. You strengthen it every time you think it. Since temptation always begins with a thought, the quickest way to neutralize this alert is to turn your attention to something else. Don't fight the thought. Just change the channel of your mind and get interested in another idea. This is the first step in defeating temptation. Excuse me, guys. The battle for sin is won or lost in your mind. Whatever gets your attention will get you. That's why Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon a young woman. And that's scripture too. Let me actually bookmark this, guys, and I'll tell y'all those scriptures in the, in the back. Okay, and David prayed, keep me from paying attention to what is worthless. That's scripture three. Have you ever watched a food advertisement on television and suddenly felt you were hungry? Have you ever heard someone cough and immediately felt the need to clear your throat? Ever watch someone release a big yawn and felt the urge to yawn yourself? You may be yawning right now as you read this. That is the power of suggestion. We naturally move toward whatever we focus our attention on. The more you think about something, the stronger it takes hold of you. We're on page 211 for you following along with me in the book. That is why repeating I must stop eating too much or stop smoking or stop lusting is a self-defeating strategy. It keeps you focused on what you don't want. It's like announcing, I'm never going to do what my mom did. You are setting yourself up to repeat it. Most diets don't work because they keep you thinking about food all the time, guaranteeing that you'll be hungry. In the same way, a speaker who keeps repeating to herself, don't be nervous, sets herself up to be nervous. Instead, she should focus on anything except her feelings, on God, on the importance of her speech, or on the needs of those listening. Temptation begins by capturing your attention. What gets your attention arouses your emotions. Then your emotions activate your behavior and you act on what you felt. The more you focus on, I don't want to do this, the stronger it draws you into as well. Ignoring, one second guys. Ignoring a temptation is far more effective than fighting it. Once your mind is on something else, the temptation loses its power. So when temptation calls you on the phone, don't argue with it, just hang up. Sometimes this means physically leaving a tempting situation. This is one time it is okay to run away. Get up and turn off the television set. Walk away from a group that is gossiping. Leave the theater in the middle of the movie. To avoid being stung, stay away from the bees. Do whatever is necessary to turn your attention to something else. Spiritually, your mind is your most vulnerable organ. To reduce temptation, keep your mind occupied with God's word and other good thoughts. You defeat bad thoughts by thinking of something better. This is the principle of replacement. You overcome evil with good. That's scripture four. Satan can't get your attention when your mind is preoccupied with something else. That's why the Bible repeatedly tells us to keep our minds focused. Somebody say that with me. Focused. That's scripture five. Always think about Jesus Christ. That's six. Fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. That's scripture seven. If you're serious about defeating temptation, you must manage your mind and monitor your media intake. The wisest man who ever lived warned, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Don't allow trash into your mind indiscriminately. Be selective. Choose carefully what you think about. Follow Paul's model. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Christ. That's scripture nine. This takes a lifetime of practice, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can reprogram the way you think. Now, the next point, guys, so we looked at um, refocus your attention on something else. Now we're looking at reveal your struggle to a godly friend or a support group. And we're going to close in the next, um, like next, next in um, like nine, eight minutes or so. Reveal your struggle to a godly friend or support group. You don't have to broadcast it to the whole world, but you need at least one person you can honestly share your struggles with. 
The Bible says you are better off to have a friend than to be all alone. If you fall, your friend can help you up. But if you fall without having a friend nearby, you are really in trouble. That's scripture 10. Let me be clear. If you're losing the battle against a persistent bad habit, an addiction, or a temptation, and you're stuck in a repeating cycle of good intention, failure, guilt, you will not get better on your own. You need the help of other people. Some temptations are only overcome with the help of a partner who prays for you, encourages you, and holds you accountable. God's plan for your growth and freedom includes other Christians. Authentic, honest fellowship is the antidote to your lonely struggle against those sins that won't budge. God says it is the only way you're going to break free. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That's scripture 11. Do you really want to be healed of that persistent temptation that keeps defeating you over and over? God's solution is plain. We're on page 213 for you following along with me in the book. Don't repress it, confess it. Somebody say that with me. Don't repress it, confess it. Don't conceal it, reveal it. Revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. Hiding your hurt only intensifies it. Problems grow in the dark and become bigger and bigger. But when exposed to the light of truth, they shrink. You are only as sick as your secrets. So take off your mask. Stop pretending you're perfect and walk into freedom. Excuse me, guys. And settle that church. This is him speaking. Well, this whole thing is him speaking, but this is his church. We have seen the awesome power of this principle to break the grip of seemingly hopeless addictions and persistent temptations through a program we developed. Excuse me, guys. Called Celebrate Recovery. It is a biblical eight-step recovery process based on the Beatitudes of Jesus and built around small support groups. In the past 10 years, over 5,000 lives have been set free from all kinds of habits, hurts, and addictions. And just keep in mind, guys, that this book um, was copyrighted in 2002. So this book is from some years ago. But it's still, I'm not taking away from anything. I'm just telling you guys, it probably doubled in number or something by now. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's still, you know, powerful as a matter of the date that it was, you know, so, okay, from all kinds of habits, hurts, and addictions, today the program is using thousands of churches. I highly recommend it for your church. And then this, this box says, the truth is whatever you can't talk about is already out of control in your life. Okay, Satan wants you to think that your sin and temptation are unique, so you must keep them a secret. The truth is we're all in the same boat. We all fight the same temptations. 12 and all of us have sinned 13. Millions have felt what you're feeling and have faced the same struggles you're facing right now. The reason we hide our faults is pride. We want others to think we have everything under control. The truth is, whatever you can't talk about is already out of control. The truth is, whatever you can't talk about is already out of control in your life. Problems with your finances, marriage, kids, thoughts, sexuality, secret habits, or anything else. If you could handle it on your own, you would have already done so. But you can't. Willpower and personal resolutions aren't enough. Some problems are too ingrained, too habitual, and too big to solve on your own. You need a small group or an accountability partner who will encourage you, support you, pray for you, love you unconditionally, and hold you accountable. Then you can do the same for them. Whenever someone confides to me, I've never told this to anyone until now, I get excited for that person because I know they are about to experience great relief and liberation. The pressure valve is going to be released, and for the first time, they are going to see a glimmer of hope for their future. It always happens when we do what God tells us to do by admitting our struggles to a godly friend. Let me ask you a tough question. What are you pretending isn't a problem in your life? What are you afraid to talk about? You're not going to solve it on your own. Yes, it is humbling to admit our weaknesses to others, but lack of humility is the very thing that is keeping you from getting better. The Bible says God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. That's scripture 14. And let's keep reading. We're going to talk about resist the devil, realize the vulnerability. And I'm going to do my best in the next few minutes to also give you all the scriptures. If I don't get a chance to give you guys the scriptures, I'll post them below for the this day um, in, the, in the description box. So resist the devil. After we have humbled ourselves and submitted to God, we are then told to defy the devil. The rest of James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I think this will be the last video for now for today. We don't passively resign ourselves to his attacks. We are to fight back. The New Testament often describes the Christian life as a spiritual battle against evil forces. Using word terms such as a fight, 
such as fight, conquer, strive, and overcome. Christians are often compared to soldiers serving enemy territory. How can we resist the devil? Paul tells us, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 15. The first step is to accept God's salvation. You won't be able to say no to the devil unless you said yes to Christ. Without Christ, we are defenseless against the devil, but with the helmet of salvation, our minds are protected by God. Remember this, if you are a believer, Satan cannot force you to do anything. He can only suggest. Second, you must use the word of God as your weapon against Satan. Jesus modeled this when he was tempted in the wilderness. Every time Satan suggest, uh, suggested a temptation, Jesus countered by quoting scripture. He didn't argue with Satan. He didn't say, I'm not hungry, when tempted to use his power to meet a personal need. He simply quoted scripture from memory. We must do the same. There is power in God's word and Satan fears it. Before we get on to the next um, paragraph, let me give you guys all the scriptures for day 27. The next two pages is day 28. It takes time. We will pick that up tomorrow, Lord's will. I'll try to make some time tomorrow, Lord's will, to come on and read um, some chapters for you all. So day 27, defeating temptation. Scripture 1 is James 4, 7, 2, Job 31, 1, 3, Psalms 119, 37, 8, 4, Romans 12, 21, 5, Hebrews 3, 1, 6, 2 Timothy 2, 8, 8 is, um, so 6 is 2 Timothy 2, 8, 7 is Philippians 4, 8, 8 is Proverbs 4, 23, 9 is 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 10 is Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, 11, James 5, 16, 12, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 13, Romans 3, 23, 14 is James 4, 6 through 7, 8, 15, Ephesians 6, 17, 16, Jeremiah 17, 9, 17, Proverbs 14, 16, 18, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Okay, we're jumping back into um, 2, 15. Okay, don't ever try to argue with the devil. He's better at arguing than you are and having had thousands of years to practice. You can't bluff Satan with logic or your opinion, but you can use the weapon that makes him tremble. The truth of God. That is why memorizing scripture is absolutely essential to defeating temptation. You have quick access to it whenever you're tempted. Like Jesus, you have the truth stored in your heart, ready to be remembered. If you don't have any Bible verses memorized, you've got no bullets in your gun. I challenge you to memorize one verse a week for the rest of your life. Imagine how much stronger you'll be. Realize your vulnerability. God warns us never to get cocky and overconfident. That is the recipe for disaster. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. That means we are good at fooling ourselves. That was number 16. Given the right circumstances, any of us are capable of any sin. We must never let down our guard and think we're beyond temptation. Don't carelessly place yourself in tempting situations. Avoid them. That's 17. Remember that it is easier to stay out of temptation than to get out of it. The Bible says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. And I'm going to post the day 27 thinking about my purpose as the thumbnail for today. For the point to ponder, verse to remember, and question to consider. God bless. Thanks for joining. You guys have a great day.